organization and at UCT, et cetera. It's good to be here. Um, yeah, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, hear me out. I hope everyone finds this uh, presentation uh, relatively interesting and I'd appreciate any sort of remarks or insights or ideas that you might have that uh, we didn't address in this paper. Um, the data that we use is quite novel, um, not only in South Africa's context, but in the, in the world. Um, and I'll speak more about it in more detail later. Um, but yeah, I appreciate any of your insights and uh, yeah, I think we should uh, just get started. I'll just figure out how to share my screen. Uh, there we go. Yes, it's the big green button right in front of me. All right. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, cool. we can. Great. Let's go to the presentation. Okay. Can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Cool. Cool. Now let's get started. So, Thanks, Nerevia, for the introduction. So for those uh, that didn't hear, uh, my name's Tim. Um, I'm a junior researcher and PhD candidate at the Development Policy Research Unit based in the School of Economics at the University of Cape Town. Um, and I'm also a PhD candidate there. And my supervisor is Professor Harun Borat, who is the uh, Saatchi Chair in Economic Growth, uh, Poverty and uh, the Labor Market and the Nexus between them all. Um, and he's also a professor in the School of Economics, and he's also my, my boss, so there's a dynamic for you. And uh, today I'll be presenting some work on uh, the COVID-19 induced uh, changes to South Africa's social protection system, specifically social assistance with respect to the social grants. Uh, we'll also have a look into the early labor market effects of the uh, pandemic induced lockdown on the labor force. And uh, through that frame, uh, we'll be analyzing whether social grants or the expansion thereof, uh, the distribution of them were pro poor in the beginning of lockdown, at least. And we use a novel data set called the NIDSCRAM, uh, which I assume most people uh, attending this uh, webinar would have heard of. Um, but if not, don't worry, I'll be describing it a little, in a little bit more detail later. All right. Okay. So just some background, um, we know that uh, national lockdowns around the world, they impose restrictions on social mobility and physical interaction, and we know their aim is to curb the spread of the virus. But we know that many households, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, um, are not ready to comply, or not able to comply with the recommendations for protection, specifically non-pharmaceutical recommendations, uh, such as physical distancing. Uh, in an earlier paper released about a month or two ago, Brown et al. found that in sub-Saharan Africa, just 4% of households were able to. And when we look at, uh, when we disaggregate households across the household income distribution, uh, they found that virtually zero are able to comply who uh, live in the poorest 40% of households. Uh, the region sub-Saharan Africa is also estimated to be the worst hit with regards to poverty. Uh, primarily through employment transitions in the labor market. Uh, also, about a month or two ago, Valencici estimated that uh, uh, the extreme poverty headcount or those living on less than $1.90 a day per person a day would increase by 2.7 uh, percentage points. Uh, in absolute terms, that's an additional 31 million people. Or in other words, uh, going back to our level of uh, extreme poverty in 2011. Uh, and like I said, uh, these transitions in and out of poverty are largely uh, translated through the labor market. Uh, and why these lockdowns, as we all know, are expected to have such adverse effects is because we know that a large proportion of the labor force in the region can't continue working, uh, either at all or uh, at home. Uh, in South Africa, using pre-crisis uh, labor force data, uh, David Francis and the team at WITS uh, estimated that just two in every uh, two in every five workers, 40% uh, in South Africa, were permitted to work under the most stringent uh, lockdown level five. Um, and similarly, uh, Amy Kerr and Andrew Thornton, also at UCT, uh, also using pre-crisis data, 
Um, so there are a few assumptions there, but it's the best that we had at the time. Uh, they estimated that just over uh, three in every five uh, workers in South Africa were neither essential workers, nor could they work from home. So the bulk of the labor force uh, were, so to speak, in a vulnerable position. Um, the same paper estimated that I think it was just 14% of workers could feasibly work from home uh, based on a few assumptions. Cool. So in response um, to national lockdowns or uh, stay at home policies, most countries around the world have expanded their social protective systems to distribute resources to the most vulnerable in the country. Um, and this increase in response has been unprecedented. And I know the word unprecedented has been unprecedented in these times, but this is truly remarkable. Um, in March, uh, well, shall I first say, Gentilini et al. in 2020, it's from the World Bank, uh, they have this living paper out uh, where they document changes in social protection systems uh, during the COVID-19 period across the world. They document that in March, uh, just there are about 103 measures, existing measures in about 43 countries across the world. And as of 22 May, this increased by more than 800% uh, to just under 1,000 measures in 190 countries, all in the space of just two months. Uh, and most of uh, the social protection is in the form of non-contributory social assistance programs, uh, half of which being cash transfers or social grants. Um, in South Africa, our government uh, similarly expanded our social protection, specifically in the form of social assistance for six months, uh, along both the intensive and extensive margins. Uh, intensive being that they increased the amount of all existing social grants by about 250, except for the child support grant. And then along the extensive margin by introducing a new special temporary uh, COVID-19 social relief of the distress grant. Uh, estimates vary about the uh, number of expected beneficiaries or recipients, but depending on your assumptions, uh, this implies, uh, this is expected to benefit obviously existing grant recipients and beneficiaries of about 18 million and then plus an additional eight to 12 million. So a large proportion of the population were expected to be absorbed into the social assistance system in a very short amount of time. So this paper aims to use the NIDS-CRAM data, uh, which is the first data, first broadly representative data uh, in South Africa's context uh, to exist during the lockdown period. Uh, to evaluate uh, whether this expansion of social grants and social grants in general were being successfully targeted towards the most vulnerable groups, uh, individuals in low income households and those who experienced job loss between April and February and April 2020. Uh, yeah, so in the context of the lockdown and uh, COVID-19 crisis. So we specifically look at differences in labor market outcomes across the household income distribution both before and after lockdown. And we focus on the labor market because uh, we largely focus on the relationship between um, poverty transitions, uh, adverse shocks and uh, employment transitions. Uh, Simone Squitter last year released the paper, published a paper uh, where she showed that uh, at least in her sample, uh, employment transitions in South Africa play a particularly important role uh, with respect to poverty. Cool. So let me describe the uh, data set that we used. Um, so the NIDS-CRAM was uh, part of this collaborative research project across five South African universities. Um, I believe it's uh, UCT, Stellenbosch, BITS, uh, Rhodes, and I believe UWC, um, with about 30 social science researchers involved, as included. Uh, with the primary aim to provide rapid and reliable research uh, and ongoing research uh, during the national lockdown period in South Africa. Um, a big motivation for this was the lag in uh, existing surveys and also the postponement of existing surveys, obviously, because uh, a lot of surveys rely on face-to-face -face interviews, uh, which obviously couldn't be done given the uh, regulations. So the latest uh, nationally representative data that we have, survey data that we have, is the quarterly labor force data, uh, which uh, the latest of which is the first quarter 
of 2020, which covers until the end of March, so uh, the pre-lockdown period. The second quarter data is expected to come out later in August. Um, so a large motivation, a big motivation for the NITS CRAM was to provide rapid, reliable data to inform policy now. Uh, it's planned to be a panel survey. So it's the sample is a subsample from the, uh, the sample of the uh, wave five NITS conducted in 2017. Um, and they're going to follow up this sample uh, every month or two for the next few months until the end of the year and then going into the beginning of next year. Um, cool. So the sample is about 7,000 South African adults. Um, and like I said, it's a panel, it's longitudinal. We can follow the same individuals over time and holding, holding fingers, holding thumbs, <laughs> um, there's very little attrition. Um, so yeah, it's a really cool data set. It's super advantageous and important. And like I said, it's the best thing we have right now uh, until we get uh, more representative uh, labor force data. Why I say more representative uh, is because the NIDSCRAM can be described as broadly representative of the national population. Uh, and I'll describe that in the next slide. First, I'd just like to make two notes. Uh, in our analysis, we uh, make some adjustments to how we define employment uh, and how uh, earnings and household income uh, is measured. Uh, it's important to adjust employment in any analysis during a national lockdown period for several reasons uh, across the world. One would be that conventional definitions of employment aren't necessarily appropriate during a national lockdown. Um, for example, if an individual was regarded as employed, uh, subject to them reporting positive working hours and positive wages, uh, they'd be you know, conventionally defined as employed. However, we have many individuals in the NIDSCRAM during a national lockdown who still have a job to return to, but they're currently furloughed in the sense that they're either not working any hours or they still have a job uh, or a sort of job contractual position but they're, uh, they're not earning any income from that job. Um, so in the NIDSCRAM, in the, in the discussion with the NIDSCRAM researchers, we had to spend some time in trying to figure out what was the most appropriate way to define employment and subsequently employment changes in this context. Um, at the end of the day, uh, we reached a broad consensus on just on not relying on reports of working hours or earnings, and just regarding uh, responses to the three questions here, which were in February and April. Uh, did you have any kind of good job? Yes or no? Did you work for any profit or pay? Yes or no? And did you do any kind of business? Yes or no? Same goes for April. Um, and in the NIDS CRAM, in the labor market module of the survey, questions were asked retrospectively. So. People were surveyed in this first wave of the NISCRAM, people were surveyed in May and June. Um, but the questions regarding to their labor market status and outcomes were retrospective. Uh, they were asked about, for example, their employment status and their earnings in February, i.e. giving a, a pre-lockdown sort of benchmark. And then they were asked uh, about the equivalent outcomes in April, uh, the first month of the national lockdown. Uh, in further rounds of the NIDS CRAM, uh, they'll be asked of subsequent months, and they'll be really cool because then we can, researchers are able to analyze employment transitions and possible unemployment traps and how this varies across different groups of people. Cool. Um, and then we make some adjustments to household income and earnings, uh, mainly just adjusting for uh, when people respond uh, with bracket amounts, i.e. I earn between 20 and 25,000 a month, as opposed to a numerical value. We assign them the mean uh, numerical response within that bracket. Uh, we adjust for outliers by using an approach uh, advised by Martin Wittenberg uh, in South African survey data. And then we do trimming of the first and 99th percentile. We similarly uh, do the same for household income and we make some replacements. Uh, yeah. And on that note, let me go to the next slide. Cool, so how representative is the NISCRAM? The NISCRAM isn't nationally representative of 
South African adults outcomes in 2020, uh, primarily because of the sampling frame. Um, the sampling frame of the NIDS cram are individuals from households in the fifth wave of the NIDS, which was in 2017, uh, who were aged 18 years or older at the time of the NIDS cram survey in 2020, so in May or June. Um, and because of this, it's rather broadly representative, meaning that it's representative of individuals who were aged 15 years or older in 2017, who were followed up three years later. Um, additionally, individuals who were surveyed in the fifth wave of the NIDS were themselves followed up, most of them at least, were themselves followed up from the first wave of the NIDS conducted in 2008. And although, you know, we have post-stratification post weights which uh, seek to account for attrition um, and to uh, make the uh, sample uh, na more nationally representative, um, we know that the NIDS uh, can't account for factors such as selective migration. Um, so yeah, long story short, the NIDS cram is broadly representative and the best thing we have at the moment, um, but we can't say it's nationally representative uh, of adult outcomes in 2020. Um, we do believe that the results of the CRAM are representative of the broad underlying dynamics in the South African labor market at the moment or in the beginning of the national lockdown. Um, but because of differences in sampling design uh, and the sample frame, it's difficult to compare estimates from the NIDS CRAM to the uh, other surveys like the QLFS, for example. Uh, furthermore, the household income question in the NIDS CRAM is a one-shot question. Uh, asks, someone has just asked, uh, what was your household income for April? Um, whereas in the NIDS in 2017, uh, individuals were asked uh, individual questions um, and then data from those individual questions were aggregated to get household income. Furthermore, in, in the NIDS, um, not every individual who was interviewed were asked about household income. It was usually either the household head or the uh, uh, sort of someone who was regarded as uh, being most knowledgeable about uh, household expenditure. And I'm not entirely sure um, how they did that. There's, uh, yeah, it's more clear in the uh, documents. But yeah, whereas in the NIDS CRAM, it's an individual based survey. Um, and also just because of time constraints, uh, NIDS CRAM was conducted over the telephone, so there wasn't time to uh, fit in all the one-shot questions. Cool. Uh, and then there are other some important differences between NIDS and NIDS CRAM. Uh, obviously, the latter is conducted over the phone, so subsequently it's shorter, it's about 20 minutes, whereas NIDS is uh, much longer and more detailed. And the NIDS is a household-based survey. It's individual level, but it's household-based. Um, so you can identify everyone who belongs in a particular household um, and then you can derive household level variables uh, for individual level uh, observations. Uh, whereas in the NIDS CRAM, uh, there was no, although individuals were sampled from the NIDS, there was no limit to or, or specific aim of uh, the number of individuals from a given household to sample. Um, so it's basically an individual based survey, whereas NIDS is a household based survey. Both are individual level, but yeah. So for most of the variables in the CRAM, we can't derive household based uh, variables from the individual questions unless the question itself asks about someone's household level outcome, like household income, for example. Yeah. Uh, so despite all of these caveats, and I had to mention them because it's, an, it's really important to be thinking about how representative our findings and our outcomes are, um, there are some important advantages to the NIDS CRAM. The first obviously being is that there's currently no similarly existing data set in South Africa during the lockdown period. Um, and two, because the NIDS CRAM is a panel, because the, uh, the sample is a subsample from the NIDS in wave five in 2017, uh, it's a longitudinal data set which allows us to not only follow individuals over time, um, but it also allows us to uh, check back on uh, individuals, uh, NIDS CRAM individuals' records in 2017. 
which is really cool because this allows us to check whether certain key estimates are either over or underestimated based on their information in 2017, obviously depending on the variable. And this is unlike any other data set in the world, at least to our knowledge. Um, whereas there are quite a lot of uh, phone-based surveys ongoing in the world now, we believe that the NIDS CRAM is the only one which can be linked back to uh, previous records of the same individuals. So yeah, it's pretty cool. All right, so now that all the caveats are discussed, uh, we can move on to the actual paper. So this figure is just a basic structure of the South African Social Protection System, which we can divide into one social assistance and two social insurance. All right, and this paper in particular will focus on the pandemic-induced expansion of social assistance, namely social grants. Um, we won't be touching on social insurance, like the uh, changes to the UIF system, um, or changes to private or public medical aid schemes, or public works programs. Uh, we're, we're just focusing on the expansion of grants. Cool. So this first table provides an overview of uh, the grant system uh, for the last 10 years uh, by grant type and uh, grant amount and also the number of uh, recipients. Uh, and I think most of us are familiar with the number of, uh, number of beneficiaries rather or the number of grants distributed. Uh, in the 2009-10 financial year, just under 14 million uh, grants were distributed. Uh, and 10 years later, this uh, increased by about 31% to just under 18 million uh, as per the National Treasury documents. And we know that the grant amounts obviously vary by grant type, uh, the largest being the older person's grant, which was previously referred to as the old age pension. I believe it's now called the older person's grant and the disability grant, which is now about 1,860 Rand, uh, has about uh, 3 million three and a half million uh, recipients and the disability grant about one million. And then the largest grant in terms of the number of grants distributed is the child support grant, which is, has a much lower amount of about 440 Rand now relative to 10 years ago. In nominal terms, it was 240. And 10 years ago, it had about uh, nine, and a half, um, nine and a half million child support grants were distributed. Uh, so nine and a half uh, million beneficiaries to about uh, 13 million now. Yeah, um, and I won't be going into the eligibility criteria um, for each particular grant, but uh, I'd just like to explicitly note that, and this will come, in, come into hand later, the, we know that an individual can receive more than one child support grant or foster care grant, um, but not necessarily more than one uh, old age pension or disability grant. Um, and there are limitations in the CRAM with respect to identifying how many grants an individual receives. Um, but yeah, we'll go on later. Cool. Now, the, this table just presents changes, uh, pandemic-induced changes to uh, South African social assistance, specifically social grants. Again, we know that it was one um, on the intensive margin. Each grant was topped up by about 250 Rand except for the child support grant. Uh, and then on the extensive margin, there was with the introduction of the special COVID-19 social relief of the chefs grant, which was 350 Rand uh, per person per month, uh, all for the next six months. Um, and obviously depending on the uh, pre-crisis grant amount, the relative increases uh, varied across grant type. Uh, the child support grant increased by just under 70% uh, in May we had increased by 300 Rand, owing to its low base of 440 Rand. Whereas um, a high valued grant, such as the older person's grant, uh, increasing by 250 Rand only increased it by just under 14% uh, in May. Now from May to October, all grants uh, were to be topped up by 250 Rand. Whereas the child support grant, in May it's been topped up, it was topped up by 300 Rand per grant but from June to October, it's been topped up by 500 Rand per caregiver. So that is important implications for the amount of resources that are being distributed to low-income households, which have uh, 
uh, dissimilar uh, number of eligible children in their households, um, which we discuss a bit in depth in the paper. Um, presumably, uh, the DSD or SASA took this, uh, made this decision because prior to the expansion of the grant system, um, there were vocal calls for particularly topping up the child support grant uh, for many reasons, one of which being that uh, it showed that a large proportion of workers in the informal sector co-resided with child support grant recipients. So it was the uh, arguably one of the most efficient means to target resources to those workers and households. Um, however, it's not clear why the DSD changed it from a 300 rand per grant in May top up to a 500 rand per caregiver, presumably because in addition to topping up the child support grant, the department also topped up all other grants and then additionally introduced the special COVID-19 grant. So yeah, but we can discuss that later. Cool, now moving on to some of our findings, we just start off with uh, presenting the distribution of real per capita household income, um, across the uh, household income distribution in April, in the beginning of lockdown. And what this graph implies is that uh, something that we're all familiar with, South Africa is an incredibly unequal society. And just looking at it, at it from a uh, per, capita, per capita household income lens, we can see that the need to support poor households during the lockdown is very clear. And this isn't even taking into account uh, the adverse effects of the lockdown on the labor market outcomes. We know that uh, in the poorest 50% of households, uh, the average individual receives about 270 Rand, whereas uh, individuals who live in the richest 10% of households receive about 30, more than 30 times that amount, about uh, 8,400 Rand. Anyone who's familiar with the distribution of per capita household income in South Africa uh, would know or would recognize that this distribution is relatively low uh, compared to other surveys. Um, and this could be for several reasons, one of which being that this is the distribution in April, the beginning of lockdown. So it might be endogenous to uh, some effects that were already, uh, already took place from the lockdown with respect to income losses. Uh, two, we have some missing values for household income in the CRAM. Uh, a substantial about like 35% of respondents don't report household income values. Um, and we don't know if there is select, we could look at it, I suppose, but uh, we don't know if there is selection into not reporting your household income, likely. Um, so we make some adjustments and we get that down to about 20% um, through accounting for grant income and earnings, et cetera. Um, but it's still a substantial amount of missing data. So that might be uh, biasing this a little bit. Um, yeah, cool. But regardless of those, uh, the shape of this distribution is very much similar to what we know from other surveys. Cool. So going into some of our labor market findings, we can see that regardless of measure, um, the labor market effects of the pandemic induced lockdown disproportionately affected individuals in low income households um, or vulnerable groups. We see this across the NITS CRAM working paper series, which are all available online to anyone who would like to either work with the data themselves or read the papers. There are about 11 of them. And regardless of your definition of a vulnerable group, be it a person of color, uh, people living in low income households, people on the lower end of the earnings distribution, uh, women, et cetera, uh, people in uh, elementary occupations, uh, they all exhibit uh, far more severe effects with respect to like employment losses and income losses, et cetera, relative to uh, those who weren't in vulnerable positions in the labor market to begin with. So these are outcomes uh, in basically in two different periods, February and April, so pre-lockdown and in the beginning of lockdown across the real household income distribution organized by Quintal. So if we look at the first column, this would be individuals who live in the poorest 20% of households, in February, about 40% of these individuals were employed. Uh, this reduced to just, just above 19%, uh, which is more than a 50% decrease, uh, was it in April 2020. Um, 
or in other words, about 1 million less people employed. That's the estimate. Uh, in sharp contrast to if we go to the uh, column uh, number five, uh, the individuals who live in the richest 20% of households, about 80% of them were employed pre-lockdown, uh, and this changes to about 81%. That, that could represent a not necessarily more people getting jobs, but a compositional shift in the uh, distribution of the employed. Um, but those differences aren't statistically different from one another, so it's not a concern. So yeah, and then uh, when we consider, we can consider changes in real monthly earnings. Um, on average, about 900 Rand in February for individuals in the poorest 20% of households down to 100. Um, and then across the distribution, uh, we see similar reductions, but much smaller as you go up the distribution. Uh, when we consider mean weekly working hours, um, we see that on average, uh, individuals who were employed in February and were working worked an average of about just under 31 hours a week. In April, this changed to 21 hours. Um, and similarly, for individuals in uh, Quintel 5 households, they worked on average 42 and a half hours a week down to 35, 34 hours a week. So uh, even though the effects are disproportionate on the poor, um, it's obviously still concerning that uh, we see uh, adverse effects across the distribution. Oh, and I must mention there's a reason why we only report uh, the employed here versus uh, how many were unemployed across the household income distribution in February versus April. Sorry, did someone say something? Okay, I'll continue. Um, there's a reason why we only focus on the employed and that's because because of the way the questions, the labor market questions uh, for February, there's a dot here. Because of the way the labor market questions were for February were asked relative to April, there are some distinct differences. So the researchers, uh, we weren't uh, comfortable with making comparisons between the unemployed in Feb versus April, mainly because in February we can't distinguish between the discouraged and the narrowly uh, unemployed. So yeah, cool. So this graph just shows the relative reduction in employment across the household income distribution, similar to what I showed in the table. We know that individuals in the poorest 10% of household uh, experience the largest reductions in employment. Uh, and there's a very clear and sharp gradient across the distribution. 55% uh, of people in the poorest 10% of households who were employed in February weren't employed uh, in April. Um, and this varies across the distribution. Similarly, uh, we ask, uh, well, what proportion of this, these employment losses are permanent versus temporary? Um, there are a few ways to go about this in the NIDS cram. Uh, one of which is just to use this question, which asks individuals, do you have a paid activity or job to return to in the next four weeks? Um, and we can see that again, there's quite a sharp gradient. Individuals in the, who live in the poorest 50% of households, uh, barely 10% of them report having a paid job to return to, uh, in contrast to about 50% of people, one in every two, who live in the richest 10% of households. So again, still concerning that um, you know one in every two uh, don't necessarily have a paid job to return to in the next four weeks who live in the in uh, richer households, but it's very clear that it's disproportionate on the poor. Cool. And then a similar story exists when we consider uh, real monthly earnings and weekly working hours. So before lockdown, before lockdown, we see we know that grants are an important source of income for individuals in low income, low income households. Uh, using a different uh, different so data from a different survey, we'd see a similar composition of household income here. So we know that the orange or yellow bars represent income from employment, and blue income from business. Uh, we know that uh, grant receiving households, who are represented in the red bars. Um, we know that these households also receive income from other sources, although much larger shares of their household income will be attributable towards receiving grants relative to employment. 
So for example, um, individuals in the poorest 50% of households, um, about uh, 60, 65% of their household income comes from social grants versus about, uh, about 25, 30% of their income, which is from uh, the labor market. In sharp contrast to individuals who live in the richest 10% of households, where nearly 80% of income is from jobs, from employment, um, and virtually, uh, virtually 5% is from grants. Um, the, low, the low reported receipt uh, of grants of individuals in the poorest 10% of households, that small red bar there on the left, is likely due to access issues to social assistance for these individuals, um, particularly during lockdown. Um, but we, this is also another facet that we see using different surveys. Cool. And we know that uh, grant receipts substantially increases incomes, particularly for the poorer household, individuals in poorer households. Um, for this graph, we just uh, generated a simulation using household incomes of individuals prior to receipt of the grant. So we deduct uh, the grant value uh, for a particular grant type. Here we do the child support grant or the blue bars and the older person's grant for the yellow or orange bars. Um, so we take their household income before receipt of the grant and then uh, we add on their uh, add to their household income the grant amount depending on which grant they report receiving and then how many of those grants they report receiving. Um, so here we do it on the household level across the household income distribution and uh, for example individuals who live uh, in the poorest 10% of households um, receipt of the child support grant on average increases their household incomes by 65%. Uh, and that goes all the way down to 29, 23, and 12, 6, and 2% going up the distribution. Uh, and then for the older person's grant, it's slightly less pro poor. Um, and that's largely probably due to the high value of the grant of about 1,800 Rand, again, versus the child support grant, which is about 440 Rand. Uh, yeah, this still substantially increases income, incomes, but in a slightly less uh, pro poor manner. Um, and here in this graph we used, uh, because this is the household income distribution in April, we focused on the grant values in April, i.e. prior to the top-ups. The top-ups, the grant system, were uh, took place from May onwards, just to be clear. Um, and another reason for using the household income distribution in April is because it's the only household income question in the CRAM. They've only asked it for April and not other months. Cool. So here we conduct a uh, fiscal incidence analysis of additional spending on particular grants uh, during May, the uh, beginning of the, the second month of the national lockdown. And um, we do this because after analyzing the labor market effects, we see that, okay, cool, individuals in, not cool, horribly, individuals in lower income households uh, were most adversely affected with respect to the lockdown. So we, we'd like to see if the additional spending on the grants are targeting them and providing at least some relief to these households during the beginning of lockdown. So here we use a few questions to conduct this analysis and we basically want to see whether these grants are targeting poorer households. We focus on the child support grant and again the older person's grant because in the NIDS CRAM, uh, individuals were asked, do you personally receive any grant? And then if they answered yes, they're asked to report uh, which grant in particular or grants in particular they received. They could report up to three. Um, and then they were additionally asked about household level receipt. They were asked, uh, does anyone in your household uh, receive a social grant? Um, but it wasn't any grant. They were asked if they receive, if anyone in the household receives a child support grant, and if so, how many? And then uh, they were asked similarly about the old age pension or the older person's grant. Um, so on the household level, we can see exactly how not, not only the type of grant with respect to the CSG or, or OPG, but also um, the number of these grants that are going to specific households in the CRAM. 
Whereas for the personal receipt questions, they're not asked how many of a particular grant they receive. They're just asked, do you receive any grant? And if so, which one? But we know that people can receive more than one child support grant or a foster care grant, for example. Um, and we're particularly interested in the child support grant here, uh, given that it's uh, an important uh, source of relief for uh, informal sector workers who co-reside with those recipients. So here we just look at the additional spending in May. So we know the child support grant was topped up by 300 uh, and we know the older person's grant was topped up by 250. Um, and perhaps a clearer way of looking at the pro poor nature of these two grants in the beginning of lockdown would be to focus on these concentration curves here. Um, so this is just a plot broadly speaking of the cumulative share of additional spending on either the child support grant or older persons grant um, plotted against the cumulative share of the population and we order that share of the population from poorest to richest with respect to per capita household income and this was somewhat expected uh, the additional spending in may for the child support grant as per the data we're using is significantly pro poor or more pro poor relative to the older, older person's grant. Again, this is likely attributable to uh, the older person's grant being about uh, four times larger than the child support grant. Um, and we also know that receipt of the older person's grant pushes people up the income distribution naturally. Um, so yeah, for example, um, we can see from this graph that um, about 80% of the additional spending on the child support grant in May uh, accrued to just under 60%, the poorest 60% of the population. Whereas the equivalent share on the older person's grant, 80% uh, of additional spending on the older person's grant accrued to about 65, the poorest 65% uh, of, uh, of the population. Cool. We would have loved to particularly conduct a similar analysis for the special COVID-19 social relief of distress grant, um, but in the NIDS-CRAM, we only observed about 44 of the 7,000 observations uh, who reported receipt of that grant. So we weren't comfortable with uh, making any reliable estimates based on that small sample size. Um, and I think it's also likely attributable to the very inefficient and slow rollout of that grant, as uh, I'm sure we're all uh, aware of, uh, which I think has substantially changed. I believe yesterday or the day before SASA released the media release, uh, which showed that about 5 million applications had been approved uh, as of last week. Um, so hopefully in later waves of the CRAM, we'll be able to uh, to assess and analyze uh, the targeting of that grant and who has received it based on individual characteristics, et cetera. So uh, preliminary conclusions. Uh, we know that individuals in poorer households have been most adversely affected by the labor market effects of the lockdown with respect to whether we're looking at employment, uh, changes in working hours, uh, changes in monthly earnings and job security with respect to do you have a paid job to return to in the next four weeks? So getting relief to these individuals is of particular importance. Uh, fortunately, our analysis does suggest that uh, social grants seem to have been relatively well targeted in the beginning of lockdown. Um, and for particularly the child support grant, additional spending has been pro poor. Um, however, we know that households that receive grants are not immune to other sources of income shocks. We know that the composition of household income, even for low income households, uh, includes income from other sources like remittances and the labor market. And although the top ups to the existing grants and the introduction of the new grant uh, are important additions to the social protection system, we believe that it's unlikely these top-ups are unlikely to sufficiently compensate for income losses from other sources of income, particularly from the labor market for these households. Um, which leads us to our policy considerations. 
the first and perhaps most obvious one would be to urgently address the inefficiencies uh, of the slow rollout of the COVID-19 grant and possibly the eligibility. Why I say that is because uh, the aggregate employment loss uh, between February and April uh, estimated in the CRAM was about 3 million people, 3 million people less people employed in April relative to February. Um, what's particularly concerning is that of those 3 million, 2 million are women. Um, and official, uh, official SASA data shows us that, uh, so, so two thirds of the employment losses in the CRAM are women. But the official SASA data shows us that two thirds of the COVID-19 grant recipients are men. Um, so although there might be some, you know, we could argue about uh, household composition and distribution or allocation of resources within the household, um, there seems to be some sort of disparity there. And this is probably attributable towards eligibility requirements of the COVID-19 grant. Um, one being uh, the one of interest here is that uh, you're not eligible to receive the grant if you are receiving uh, any other grant. And we know that most grant recipients of existing grants besides the COVID-19 grant are women. Uh, most caregivers for the child support grant, the largest grant, are women. Um, so perhaps uh, this presents some sort of justification for considering changes in eligibility of that grant. Um, or alternatively, uh, policymakers ought to consider amending the existing child support grant top up. Uh, from a uh, per giver, caregiver grant, which was the 500 rand per caregiver, regardless of the number of eligible children that you have, which took place from June onwards, uh, and amending that to a per grant top up, um, which will be in line with the grant's uh, initial uh, motivation for following the child. Um, yeah. Uh, this is obviously subject to more analysis in the next wave of existing uh, grant receipts, uh, particularly for the child support grant. And then we can also analyze um, uh, the top ups that took place uh, and how it varied across a individual's uh, or a household's number of eligible children. Uh, again, it depends on what data is included in the, in the next rounds of the CRAM. Um, and then another policy consideration would be to extend the top up the top ups to the grant system uh, beyond October, perhaps to the end of the year, or uh, to keep the conversation topical, go big or go home. Uh, is it time to, again, 20 years later, consider a sort of targeted basic income grant? I'm not sure, I'd be keen to discuss. Thank you.